you have questions, the Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone, I'm Mike McDaniel, the preacher for the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. And this is a Bible answer. This program is dedicated to answering questions from you, our viewers. At the halfway point of our program, and again at the end, you'll see our contact information, where you may call us, write us, or email us your Bible question, and we'll seek to answer it on a future program. We have three guest preachers with us to answer your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. My name is Kevin Thomason. I preach for the Bradford Church of Christ in Bradford, Tennessee. My name is Terrence Manis. I preach for the Troy Road Church of Christ in O'Brien, Tennessee. My name is Charles Taylor. I preach for the Front Street Church of Christ in Milan, Tennessee. We're glad to have these good brethren with us today to answer your questions. Now to our questions for today. Our first question goes to Brother Thomason. The person writes, We know that of Jesus' second coming, only God the Father knows the time. But can we see any signs now as to whether it is closer with the earthquakes going on in the past few years and the changing with the weather? If you can find any scripture to help out on this question, we would be very thankful. This uh, particular question I know comes from a couple of prison inmates who were concerned about this and sent us their question. We're very happy that they did so. We'll give that to you, Brother Thomason. Thank you so much for the question. It is true that the time of the second coming of our Lord and Savior is unknown to man. So clear is this point that the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, but of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Paul made it clear that concerning the time of the second coming of Christ, the seasons concerning the second coming of Christ, there was no need to write about that. He goes on to say, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Think about the coming of the thief. He does not announce the time of his coming, so his coming is unknown. His coming is unannounced unknown as far as the time. He, he takes us completely by surprise. And Paul, by inspiration, says the second coming of Christ will be as a thief. The time is not announced. Therefore, it is unknown. It will take us by surprise. Uh, think about this just for a moment. This being true, it stands to reason there are no signs pointing to the time or the season of the second coming of Christ. Our Lord and Savior Himself said in Matthew 24, verse 36, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Only the Father knows the time of the second coming of His Son, and He has not revealed that time to us. When it comes to the second coming of our Lord and Savior, the key to this is to always be ready. Christ said in Matthew 24, verse 44, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. So we need to make sure that we have obeyed the gospel of Christ and that we are living faithfully. Whether Christ comes today, next week, next year, years from now, if we are faithful to Him, we will be ready. If He does not come in our lifetime, John said, Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord. So we're still ready. So that's the key to the second coming of our Lord and Savior. We do not know the time, so it's always safe to be ready. Now concerning the earthquakes, I'd like us to turn our attention to Matthew chapter 24. <clears throat> and in Matthew chapter 24, verse 7, Christ said, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. Now many people will go to Matthew chapter 24 and they read verse 7 and they apply that to the second coming of Christ. But does this verse apply to the second coming? 
You will note as the context begins in Matthew 24, verse 1, Jesus went out and departed from the temple. He's been in the temple. He's in Jerusalem. His disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. You might also want to take in mind in this study, Mark 13 and Luke 21. So Christ and his disciples, they exit the temple, and his disciples are talking about the beautiful buildings of the temple and what manner of stones the, the temple was built of. Keep in mind that the temple was uh, the pride and joy of the Jewish people. So they're talking about this. Verse 2, Christ said, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. What has Christ just revealed to his disciples? That that temple was going to be leveled, destroyed to such an extent not so much as one stone would be left upon another. You come to verse 3, and on the Mount of Olives, the disciples ask him in private, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And the context, what things are they referring to? The only thing that's been revealed thus far is the destruction of the temple. We know that occurred in A.D. 70. Now, in their mind, they may have been thinking something so violent and destructive that was going to destroy the temple, they may have been thinking, will that be the end of the world? So they basically asked two questions here. Tell us when shall these things be, the destruction of the temple, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? So they may have been putting both of those things together, but regardless of that, we know they are at least concerned about two questions. When will the temple be destroyed? What's the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? When Christ starts answering their question, he is answering the first question first. He's dealing with the destruction of Jerusalem. In fact, if you come down in the context, verse 34, Christ said, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So from verse 34 back up to verse 4, he is dealing with the destruction of the, uh, Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, which occurred in A.D. 70. And although there are passages in there that may sound like the second coming, we've got to keep in mind verse 34. And that would get, verse 7, the earthquakes. So he was not applying the earthquakes to the second coming. He was applying the earthquakes to uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. That was a sign that that destruction was uh, coming close. In fact, when you get to verse 36, you will see him change the context. He now starts talking about the second coming and the end of the world. He says, but of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So that's in contrast to what he has said. So there were signs pointing to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, but there are no signs pointing to the second coming of our Lord and Savior. So earthquakes uh, have been occurring for thousands of years, and uh, they are not a sign uh, pointing to the second coming of Christ. And the weather's the same thing. Uh, one thing we can say for sure about the weather, it's going to change. And uh, we're going to sometimes see periods where we see weather that is strange to us. Maybe it's unseasonably cool when it should be warm or or there may be times in December, you may be out in the yard in the short sleeve, next December we may have bitter cold, so the weather changes. One thing we can say for sure about the weather, Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. God said we're going to have cold and heat. He didn't say how cold or how hot. That's going to vary. He said we're going to have summer and winter. We may have mild summers. We may have extremely hot summers. We may have mild winters. We may have uh, extremely uh, cold winters. But neither the earthquakes uh, nor the weather would be indicating that the time of the second coming of Christ is drawing near. The bottom line on that is, as God has told us, a man does not know the time because he has not revealed the time. Always keep in mind Always be faithful. Continue to study what the Bible says concerning the judgment. 
the second coming of Christ. Always keep that in our mind that it could happen at any time. And so let's be safe and let's be faithful and let's be ready. Thank you so much for your question. Thank you, Brother Thomason. Now to Brother Manis. Brother Manis, the person says some refer to the Bible as an ancient, archaic book that is unimportant today. How important is the Bible to our continued well-being? Brother Manis. Even though some of the opinion that the Bible is ancient and archaic, but let's go to the scriptures and see what the scriptures have to say. Jeremiah 10 and verse number 23. O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to, to, to direct himself. Man is incapable of finding his own way or going uh, to the right way while depending upon himself. His own wisdom and experiences without revelation from one who knows all and knows better than man ever could know. And then Psalms 32 in verse number 8. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. God's vision is perfect and he sees with such clarity we can depend on his guidance. He tells us how to be saved and he teaches us how to keep saved. God's word is imperishable seed that is alive today and will remain uh, to the end of time. According to 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23, Peter talks about by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. It will endure every cultural change through the ages. It cannot die or be destroyed. Many have rejected it, but it still endures. The living and abiding word of God is all sufficient. It does not lack anything needed for our salvation or for the work God has laid before us to do. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 16 and 17, Paul writes to young Timothy, and he says that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and it, that it is profitable and for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The Bible is God's revelation to man. There is no other revealed truth from God beyond the 66 books of the Bible. Where did I come from? Is there life after death? How do I get to heaven? Why is the world full of evil? Why do I struggle to do good? What really matters in life? How can I live so that I do not look back with regret? You have questions and the Bible, God's word has the answer. The Bible is all sufficient for us because the scriptures reveal to us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Second Peter one and verse number three, according as the as his divine power have given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that have called us to glory and virtue. The Bible is all sufficient for us because the word of God is capable of sustaining us and leading us to an eternal inheritance. Acts 20 and verse number 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the words of his grace, which are able to build you up and give you, and give you inheritance among all of them that are sanctified. The Bible is all sufficient for us because the scriptures provide, provide spiritual light. Psalms 119 verse 130. The entrance of thy word give it light. It give it understanding unto the simple. How can we know regarding human relationships in the home, in the marketplace, towards friend, brethren, and even our enemies if we have such? And if we live the Christian life, certainly we're going to have some enemies. But God's word, the Bible, can help us know his will regarding husband and wife, parent and child, employee and employer. We can know concerning our duty and privileges regarding civil government, which is also ordained of God, according to the scripture. Except God guides us, we cannot know regarding the church. He has given us his pattern and we should respect it. Where else do we learn of standards and values and ethics and Priorities of life, the difference between right and wrong, except through his word. Could we know how to face the problems of life or even how to make the necessary decisions that mold life and uh, determine eternity without guidance from God through his word? Absolutely not. We need his word. How important is the Bible in our continual well-being? Well, the Apostle Paul writing to young Timothy, the evangelist, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 15 says, and that from a child that has known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith 
that is in Christ Jesus, or which is in Christ Jesus. And then Romans 15 and verse number four, whatsoever things are written for a four time are written for our learning that we do patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. If we ever going to have hope of making heaven our eternal resting place and living the Christian life in the process, we've got to see the importance of God's word and live day to day according to what the scriptures teach. We thank you for this good question. Thank you, Brother Manis. We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer you a free tract. Our track today is entitled, The Holy Spirit in Conversion. The Holy Spirit in Conversion, written by Brother Perry B. Cotham. We're also offering our free eight-lesson Bible correspondence course, which you may take in the privacy of your home. If you'd like the tract or the course or both, or to send us your Bible question, just contact us. You may do that by writing us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You may email us at a Bible answer at earthlink.net and you can call our toll free number at 1 800 436 0463. That's 1 800 436 0463. We're also directing people to our new website, which you may go to www.abibleanswertv.com. There you can look at past episodes of A Bible Answer. You can also submit your questions via our contact page. You can see uh, the origin of A Bible Answer and read about it, as well as look at our memorial page. Back to our questions today. Our next question to Brother Taylor. Brother Taylor, this is actually a follow-up question from a previous program. The person says, watching your show on June the 2nd, I caught the end of an answer on which day is the Sabbath day. Are the preachers supporting Saturday or Sunday as the correct day? John 14, 15 seems to answer that. It's the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Suggestions. Am I correct in saying this? Brother Taylor. I appreciate this good question. First of all, we need to understand that in the New Testament, we find a special day that believers kept. Under the Old Testament, there was a special day that the believers kept. In fact, to answer the question before I get into the scriptures, the Old Testament worshipers, they worship on Saturday, which was the seventh day. Uh, New Testament believers uh, worship on the first day of the week, which is uh, Sunday. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 5, I'm going to start around verse number 13. It says, Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day of the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, in it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservants, nor thine oxen, nor thy donkey, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger within thy gate, that thy manservant and maidservant may rest as well as thou. And verse 15 says, And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out with a mighty hand, and a stretched out arm, therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath. They were instructed on the old covenant to keep the Sabbath. He told them how to do so, and he said it was help them remember the fact that they had been in bondage. We find in the New Testament, and those who live after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, we are under the new covenant. In Acts chapter 20, and verse number 7, the Bible says, Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them and continued his speech unto midnight. We find in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 and 2, he says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, he says, As I've given orders to the churches in Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gathering when I come. And so we find the first day of the week was the day that New Testament worshipers uh, met uh, they were guided by these men who are apostles. The Holy Spirit helped the apostles know God's will. And so we know we have an approved example that those who believe in God under the new covenant, uh, they are uh, to worship on the first day of the week. We find also a, in Revelation chapter 1 and around verse number 10, John said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So to be scripturally correct, those who worship today, we worship on Sunday, the first day of the week, uh, on the Lord's Day, which is referring to Sunday. 
the New Testament teaches us that the Old Testament uh, is no longer ruling and guiding us now. We learn from it, but we are governed by the New Covenant. Uh, Colossians 2, verse 14, it says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances which was against us, which were contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. In that context, it shows and includes the Sabbath keeping. And so we realize we're not under the Sabbath or Old Testament law. We do not keep the Sabbath in this dispensation. Uh, we keep the first day of the week, which is Sunday. Matthew 28, verse 1 shows that the first day of the week comes right after the Sabbath. And also Luke 23, verse 56 through chapter 24, verse 1. I hope I've answered that question to help you. Thank you very much, Brother Tyler, for that good answer. Our next question to Brother Thomason. The person says, shouldn't we scripturally agree that we, in being a faithful New Testament Christian in this life, will become equal with those three equal persons who are scripturally made to be called God and Christ, in being our Creator and Redeemer, because in heaven we will equally possess their personage, nature, powers, and the attributes of life in our own individual being of life? We give that question to you, Brother Thomason. Thank you so much for the question. I do hope that I have in mind or properly understand what our viewer has in mind uh, in this question. I'm taking it to mean that our viewer is under the impression that in heaven we will be equal with God. I know of no scripture that teaches this. First of all, let's consider this. God is the creator. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, For in six days... The Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. So God is the creator. We, on the other hand, are the created. The psalmist said in Psalms 100 verse 3 that it's the Lord that's made us and not we ourselves. So that's never going to change. God's always going to be the creator. And we're always going to be the created. And the creator is always going to be greater than than that which he created. In Revelation chapter 4 verse 11, in view of what I've just said, we have a scene in heaven of worship. God is being worshipped. And I want to read that verse, Revelation 4 verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So here we see God being worshipped in heaven, and he's being worshipped by those that he created. And friends, that's never going to change. God's always going to be the creator, and we're always going to be the created. Now, when we consider some of God's characteristics, some of God's attributes, certainly there are characteristics and attributes uh, of God, qualities of God that you and I must have in our life. God's our Heavenly Father. If we've obeyed the gospel and we're following the gospel of His Son, God is our Heavenly Father. We are His children, so there certainly should be some resemblance. Consider this. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, Peter wrote, Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. We know that God is holy. We are to strive to the best of our ability to be like our Heavenly Father, and, and we're to be holy. Now, God's holiness does not depend on us, but our holiness does depend on God. In fact, in that same context, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, uh, Peter makes it clear that our holiness is made possible because of the gift of God's Son and the sacrifice that the Son made for us upon the cross. But we are to try to be holy. We are to try to be good as God is good. We are to try to be kind and merciful and loving. And in this life, uh, even when we are at our very best in this life, we still make mistakes. We still have sin in our life. You know, John told us if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. In heaven, certainly, these attributes that we have in our life, that God also has, certainly these things are going to be in a much greater and fuller sense because in heaven uh, there's not going to be any bad things there and we're not going to be tempted there as we are here. 
So certainly these characteristics that we have that God also has, our characteristics are going to be in, in a fuller sense. But let's consider this. There are some attributes of God that belong only to God and that we're never going to have. Consider the fact that God is the Almighty. That's why He's God. There are no scriptures that ever teach that you and I will possess that attribute. God is all-knowing. There are no scriptures that teach that you and I will ever be all-knowing. Uh, the Bible, I do believe, teaches that our knowledge in heaven will be much fuller. We'll come to understand God's will and His plan in a fuller sense. But we're never going to be all-knowing. God is omnipresent everywhere. There are no scriptures that teaches that we're ever going to have those attributes. So friends, I know of no scripture that teaches that we will be equal to God. Let's end this question by looking at Isaiah 44 and verse 6. I am the first, I am the last, and beside me there is no God. I hope this helps you with this question. Thank you. That's an interesting question, and that was a great answer. I was thinking about 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 49, which says, As we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. And so he goes on to say that we're going to be changed, we're going to be raised incorruptible, and therefore prepared to meet God. Uh, we as mortals are put on immortality. But you know, we can never be as God because God is eternal. God had no beginning and he'll have no end. We'll put on our immortal bodies and we'll be immortal, but we'll never be eternal like God. That's one attribute that we can never be like God in. The fact that God is eternal, that he is from the beginning and that he has no end. I think also of Revelation chapter 22 in verse 3 which says, And there shall be no more curse but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him. That's talking about us. Talking about you and me, the faithful of God in heaven above. We won't be resting on our laurels, laurels friend. There'll be something for us to do. We'll still be the servants of God as here on earth, and we shall serve Him. Thanks for watching a Bible Answer today. Tune in next week. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for a Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.